So what we want to talk about is one of the new features that was released just after Knowledge this year that really does improve the capabilities for customers to ingest data into the CMDB from third-party sources or from manual data sources in a much more trusted manner. Previously, we required just using data sources in a simple transform map, and 99% of customers out there would simply just coalesce on one value and have no understanding whatsoever of the identification and reconciliation engine that we want to try and utilize prior to data getting into the CBDP. So the Integration Hub ETL is that tool set, and it really does allow customers to not really have a thorough understanding of the IRE, but still leverage it effectively. So I don't want to spend too much time on this slide deck. I've only got a few slides, and I hope that most people on the call have a familiarity with the CMDB and the value that it brings to the, to the ServiceNow platform. But one thing that we certainly recognized over the years of working in this space is it's very easy for customers to load in junk data and that CMDB to become a untrustworthy tool, and therefore they don't leverage it to enhance their processes. So you look at the incident form or the change form, they may have hidden the configuration item referenced field, and they don't use it at all to receive any of the benefits from the CMDB. A lot of that comes down to not trusting the data or using just flat files that were loaded in one time and not updated over time. So we want to push our customers to obviously use ServiceNow's discovery tools. It helps us from an implementation standpoint, but it really does generate the highest quality data that's loading into the CMDB and it also guarantees that that data is going to the tables that ServiceNow expects that data to reside. Some of the naming conventions of tables aren't particularly fantastic. So it can be confusing for customers to know where they should store, say for instance, an application. So using discovery and service mapping takes away that headache. But we typically still have a scenario where they do want to bring their own data to the table, whether that's connecting into a other third-party tool, the likes of a, an SCCM, a Jamf, an Altiris, or it could just be they'll have their own repository of information, maybe on the SharePoint or on a maintaining Excel that we want to try and steer away from, but sometimes there's no other option but to, to leverage that data. And usually this will come in if it's something that isn't discoverable. So maybe it's ownership information, location information, something relying to policy and compliance that we want to store inside the CMDB. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at how we can leverage this new integration hub ETL, which realistically acts as the, the front end for the robust transform engine that transforms the data from the schema map of the data source into the appropriate format for ServiceNow, and then push that data through the identification reconciliation engine, which helps reduce the likelihood of duplicate data being put into the, to the CMDB or data from other sources overwriting existing data that we don't want to have in place. So we're in our instance right now, um, I'm just looking at configuration items that's been created today. So we're starting with a, a blank slate. Um, but customers come to us with this spreadsheet and said to us, hey, we want this to form our, our CMDB. And prior to having the integration of BTL and the robust transform engine, it was a bit of a challenge to insert this data effectively into the right places but also insert them to generate relationships of the appropriate type between these different CIs. Because we can see right here, we've got a good information to work from, but it's likely going into different classes. We've got some application information, we've got some business applications, and then we've got some hardware information that we want to, to insert as well. And we've got some network card information that's also going to be a slightly different class. So. Could be a little bit more tricky to do this. We'd have to, to script it out to make sure that it's going into to the right places and involving multiple different transfer maps to, to handle this data set. But we're going to take a look at taking this information and put it into the scene to be using the integration hub ETL. So I've created a data source just like we would have done with a regular transform. And I've attached the hardware and, and app service spreadsheet that we're looking at here completed the appropriate uh, configuration for the data source. And we're in a position now to, to load in those records. So if I come over to my integration hub ETL, I've got a few different CMDB applications that's available to me right here. Some of these have been loaded in from some of the store apps called service graph connectors. And we'll talk about those shortly. 
But I'm going to take a look at the one that we've created here for hardware to application from Excel. Some of the, the interface here going through the wizard, it's quite straightforward to, to set up. One of the key things we need is the, the data source itself. So the data source, is what we have defined, we also have to set the discovery source on the CI record. And that discovery source is what's going to feed into the identification and reconciliation engine to make a determination of if it can update that record. So if I just come over and just quickly touch on that identification and reconciliation engine, the identification part is looking for unique identifiers so it can match on an existing record in the CMDB. So from a hardware perspective, these are the ones we bring to the table out of the box. We're looking at the serial number, serial number type on the serial number table. If that isn't being populated, we fall back to the uh, serial number value on the hardware table. Then we go down to the, the name of the, the hardware record. And then the final priority is a combination of the MAC address and name. If we wanted to, we can add additional identifier entries. If we wanted to get a little bit more granular or we have a feed of information that may not align to these identifiers, but it's typically good practice, especially for the hardware side, just to, to leave it as, as it is, um, as serial number does a, a good job of acting as a unique identifier. And then leveraging that discovery source, this is where we can get control over what different sources can do what with that information. So I've just set up a quick example here of saying that discovery from ServiceNow is going to be my highest priority, and I want it to be able to update practically every single attribute on this class. So there's 92 attributes on the Windows server table. ServiceNow Discovery is gonna be the primary populator for, for that information. And I'm saying I've also got an integration with the tool Landesk. And Landesk is our source of truth for the assigned to information and location information of our inventory. So what I'm saying here is any data that comes through from Landesk can come in and update these values. But Landesk won't be able to overwrite, say for instance, the operating system information or the memory information that's being populated by ServiceNow. So we can prioritize which source we trust the most and which source gets to update which records. So one thing I'll point out here, if you're on an instance older than Paris, you may notice something called a data precedence rule. It would typically have to be at the bottom but they've kind of merged them together in Paris and merged it just with the reconciliation rule. So you now give it a priority in the actual reconciliation rule. So if you go into your own instance and are looking at this and are like, well, why doesn't it look like that? That's why. Yep, exactly. And just while we're here, the data refresh rules, you can specify a time frame. If that data source hasn't updated the record in say 14 days, you can fall back to a low prioritized data source and they can then update the record. So Landesk could potentially come and update records that ServiceNow had originally populated if ServiceNow hadn't touched it in 14 days or whatever time frame you set it to. But let's come back over to our ETL and we'll work through transforming our Excel spreadsheet into an appropriate format for ServiceNow CMDB. So looking at the preview and prepared data, this is one of the more important steps that's going to be going on. We take in that raw data set and the columns from, in this example, just our spreadsheet. And we want to try and convert this data into the appropriate format that fits in with the ServiceNow CMDB. So I've got this column name here for computer name. It looks quite good in its current format, but having done many of these kinds of imports in the past, Sometimes you get data where it's in a, like a fully qualified domain name format, and that doesn't always fit in with how you want it to be stored inside the CMDB. So inside the integration hub ETL, we have the integration and CMDB commons already associated. So this has a number of out of the box transforms that allows us to quickly manipulate the values that's come through from the, the data source. So I can cleanse the IP address if it's not in the appropriate format, um, the IP version. And there's one as well in here, like the example I'm just mentioning with fully qualified domain name where I can process it and pass it out into the appropriate formats of where I want to store it inside the CMDB. In addition, you can call script operations as well so that you can run the different script includes uh, across the, the data set. And if you want a little bit more information on some of these conversions, the docs site do a pretty good job 
of running through what these individual operators do with some examples of what the raw data insert is compared to what the result would be. Can you build your own brand new transforms or are you limited to what ServiceNow is provided you know, outside of the script? So there's, there's the script that's in there. They've got some basic steps that aren't like the full operations similar like to concatenation or trimming and splitting. So they cover most of the bases, but things that potentially may not work, you probably just have to fall back to the script. And the one thing I'll point out with the script is you want to get used to using another IDE because the way they did this is similar to the new UI in that that side panel that you see there where it says new transform, that's the space you get to write your script. So Mark, select the script part for a sec. You get a box that big and it doesn't really expand very well. Now they added this in Paris. This was not there in Orlando. Yeah. I'll tell you that much right now. So there has been improvements that's been made. Into. Yeah, Rob and I were part of one of the very first implementations at a customer site of the integration of BTL. And the very early version had a lot of bugs in it. There were some scary moments where you thought everything had disappeared. But it has got better, and you can also start doing some cloning activities now to duplicate existing ETLs, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel each and every time. The other thing I'll say here, too, is if you ever start playing with this and you start a script for the first time, do a demo of it and output everything that gets put into it, because at first it's a little confusing about what the batch actually is and what's inside the batch and the output variables and all that different stuff. If you just put the loop in and output everything and kind of do a JSON stringify on it, you'll get a better idea for how everything actually looks and it'll make a lot more sense. It took me a bit to figure that out because it wasn't well documented of what gets put in and how you're supposed to modify it. But once you get used to it, it's actually pretty simple to use. Yep. So once we've gone through our steps of, this is an example of using concatenation between the make and the model, once you've gone through and cleansed your data and got it into the appropriate format for storing in the ServiceNow CMDB. We come through and we start mapping it to the appropriate class. So we have a couple of options where we can just simply add the class itself, or we can do a conditional class. And this allows us to find various logic and if statements to basically say, if the data source for operating system contains windows, then we're going to populate into the Windows server table. And I could string a number of these together if I wanted to look for, for Linux, for SUSE, I could look for Solaris, whatever it may be. But for this example, I'm just falling back to, to hardware if it doesn't contain the word Windows. And then we're going to take a look at the, the mapping itself. So the interface that we've seen right here is very similar to what we see over in Flow Designer. We have the source data columns. And from here, I can just drag and drop into the various different attributes that we find on the Windows server table inside the CMDB. So the top right here, this is going to be our primary identifier feeding into the identification reconciliation engine using the, the serial number. We also have some reference lookups as well. That might be a different class to the Windows server class we're working from. So this is where we pop in that serial number table. We're populating the, the NIC information and anything that I can take from my source and put it into the appropriate place. Now I needed to add more data. I can just choose any of the, the columns that is available from the table I'm working from. So I go through each of my different classes that I want to have populated, utilizing the, the source information until I've got all of those mapped out. So Mark, before you go forward here, one thing I'll call out here, you'll notice things seem to load up really quickly. And it's because when you initially load this up, it actually loads a lot of this stuff into memory. That is great for performance when switching back and forth. What it's not good for is if you do any sort of attribute mappings or anything like that in another window, you'll notice that it may not show up or certain mappings are missing. So just keep that in mind. It tends to cache a lot of things. If something weird's ever happening with it, just reload the window and it tends to fix things. Yeah, and in addition, if you did clone this, this transformation, this seemed to be application for ETL, and you came to the, these mappings and it looked like there's no information there, that again is just because it's not cached and viewable. It hasn't disappeared, but it will give you a bit of a brief heart attack, especially if you've got 20 different conditional classes with all the mappings laid out. So we've been able to populate the, like the standalone CIs themselves with the data coming through from the data source. The next aspect is building up the relationships and the relationship logic between the different classes that we've, we've put in. 
And this is really where you start getting into a differentiator of, of the ease of use of the ETL over uh, using previous individual transforms. So from here, I can, I can leverage the CSDM reference guide so I know exactly which relationships that I should be, should be using. And I can specify that the parent application service has got a depends on, depends on, or used by to the Windows server. And then I'm in a position where I want to run this integration. So it's going to take that import set, it's going to run it through the robust transform engine, and it's going to provide me the results. So I can do with this in a small sample size, I'll do a cross reference with the Excel spreadsheet. So I have an understanding of what the data should be that's coming in. And I can see that I should have three application services associated with two business applications. And I've got all the other classes that we've populated from our source data. And in this as well, it's going to generate any errors if we had trouble inserting that data or if it had a identification reconciliation error, this will all be presented here in this interface. And I can see the activity log of what actually occurred. So I have full visibility into how my transformation actually applied. Now this went quite smoothly because I tested it out previously, but that's not always going to be the case. There might be some data gets inserted in the wrong place, or you made a mistake on when you dragged over the uh, transform mapping. So one of the benefits we have of using the ETL is when it comes up to this for markers complete on this step, I can either retain this data or I can perform a full rollback. So I don't have to go searching through six or seven different CI classes and deleting the, the data that I erroneously inserted. I can just perform a rollback from this interface. But for this example, I'm going to actually retain this data just so we've got data to work with. And if I come back to my configuration items and just uh, refresh this list, we can see that we have successfully inserted all of the various different CIs from that spreadsheet and put them into the appropriate spots inside the, the CMDB. And I can confirm as well that if I look at my dependency viewer, we do see that we've got a CSDM compliant where we've got our payroll business application um, associated with our payroll US prod and then the different Windows servers that's used to support that application service. Have I approached it from using the business application as our primary points? I see that I've got my development application service mapped out with the service that's used to deliver that dev instance. Any questions related to that of how we were able to successfully transform this raw data with just simple columns into a CSDM compliant model inside the CMDB? Hi, this is Michael. A real quick question for companies that are very highly virtualized. So you have like vSphere that run on, the, you know, you have Windows VMs, Linux VMs that run on a host. Is there anything different about that kind of setup than what you've shown? No, there wouldn't be. So like on the Windows server form, if it was virtualized, if you ran discovery and in addition to run the vCenter collection, you would have a virtual machine instance CI as well associated with that Windows server. So that's additional visibility we get from that connection. We could build out that same relationship and data point if it's represented in say the spreadsheet. But the one thing I always try to stay away from, if you've got highly dynamic data, such as the virtualization layer, because you might be motion it over to a different ESX host, that's not really something you want to rely on fairly static data, like a flat file. So I would be looking to run the vCenter collection directly against that instance so that you can have reliable information brought in. Thank you. I really hope that someday soon they take the vCenter integration and put it through this or put it into a pattern and get it out of a probe because of all those issues that we just talked about there. Yes. Uh, so just for other people, like when we looked at the reconciliation rules right here, the, the job that's involved for the vCenter doesn't go through the identification reconciliation engine. So you may, you could potentially generate duplicate data where You've already inserted it, say, from a flat file for all of your ESX hosts. But if you don't specify like, the more ID of that ESX, then it's not likely going to match on the existing record, and you'll get duplicate data in the CMDB. 
one thing I wanted to show finally is I took that Excel ETL and I basically just duplicated it and created one for a REST insert. The only difference here is I just changed the data source. Everything else remains exactly the same. So this here is just mimicking another data source type, which is very common. They might have a a third party tool said that's going to push data or you might pull data via REST. I just want to showcase that in action as well. So I've got this simple JSON payload. And the situation here is we've got our US prods application service, and we've just deployed an additional server to support that application service. So I'm going to send that over now to the ServiceNow instance. I'm going to come back and it would run through that transform. And let's find my tab for my thing right here. And I'm just going to refresh my dependency map. And we can see here that we've automatically ingested that information coming through from that third party source. And it's built out the relationships to our payroll US prod and it's added the new server to that model. So we can, if we have a trusted gold standard of data source that we want to use to populate our data around relationships, we can either set it up on a scheduled job to return that information or rely on them pushing that data to us. And it goes through our transformation engine to build out the right CIs and the relationships between them. So I have a question there. I noticed you just used the rest to insert straight into the import set table. So what would your data source be in the event that you were just doing that? Yeah, so the data source that I, I created is just specially import set table. And when that gets updated, it calls that robust transform engine that we created the hardware to application service from rest. And then it goes through this so, whole step. Which just, so, cause that data source was a type file, but it is, it's just going to look for any data source with a matching table name. Yeah. So I use the type file here to generate the columns in the import set. So originally I just attached this and did a load records to build up the import set table. And then from there, it's going to look for anything that gets added to that import set and processes it. Got it. This is not really technical, but are there any licensing costs associated to using it? Yeah. So this is where, I mean, service now even don't have a great handle on it. And I often have to help them out when they having that conversation. So for what we did right there, there was no licensing cost association, but ServiceNow have released what they call service graph connectors. And there's a number of them for like the common third party sources that you'll typically connect into. So whether it's like a Microsoft Intune, Jamf, SolarWinds, these are all available for people on the store. And they'll essentially just create a CDB application like I've got here for Microsoft Intune. Any data that comes through this is part of like the item visibility licensing. So if it ends up populating a CI records in a subscription unit based table, then it will consume a subscription unit. So some people might be asking like, what is a subscription unit table? So we take a look at like ServiceNow's licensing. If I use that ETL for Intune or for SCCM and it generated a, a server record or any of its extended classes from server, then it is going to consume a subscription unit, and you require ITOM visibility to, to do that. So it's always something to keep in mind. That's just for the service graph connectors, though, not if you build your own transforms. Yeah, exactly. So I did like via the REST inserts, and I did it with the Excel. That wouldn't consume a subscription unit. So essentially, if I come to my like CI's updated there, we see that I defined the like the discovery source. Um, some classes like network adapter don't get populated, but this is what it's looking at to determine whether it's licensed or not. So these ones here for REST and import set are not going to be licensed, but the ones that I have coming through from like Intune or from SCCM, those are going to have a discovery source that is going to be licensed. The other thing I'll point out here too is we're, we're showing the kind of gooey front end to this for the scene to be side of the house. They do have plans and you can actually kind of do it now in weird ways, but you can actually use this for non seem to be data as well. It's not going to be pretty like the ETL side of the house is right now. I think in the future they're going to add it in, but the robust transform engine is actually something that can be used outside of the seem to be side of this. 
I've never done it. I've never touched it for that because there's a ton of tables involved with it. And honestly, if you don't have the nice front end, there's no point in really using it simply because it's not giving you any value. But in the future, I fully expect that's the direction they're going to end up going with this. That was going to be my question as well, is can we use this for non-CMDB? So like if you're doing a, an integration with like incident management, so to speak, so instead of using like a transform map and data source, can you use the robust transform? But you're saying that in the GUI, it's CMDB specific, so you don't get all the nice front end stuff to set it all up. You'd have to kind of come in on the back end and, and do all this stuff manually. That's what you're saying. Pretty about. much. Yeah. So what Mark's showing you here when you do anything in that front end, it translates into these tables. There may be some other ones as well, but these are the main tables here that you see in the tabs. And this is how it does all that transforming. Without the GUI, it's actually extra work than just doing an import set and writing your own script, right? Right, right. <laughs> the whole value of this is the GUI and everything goes through IRE because I don't know if anyone here has ever tried to bootstrap an import set and a transform set with the IRE it's messy and it wasn't done very well. And you could tell it was done afterwards. So like before and after scripts don't really work in it. Um, you basically have to have everything mapped through a field mapping in order for that part to work if you just bootstrap it on top of an import set. So the real value here is the low code, no code mixed with the fact that everything goes through IRE with it. I fully expect probably maybe not Quebec, but like Rome timeframe they will somehow unstrap this from IRE as well and give you one for incident or any other table. Yeah. Gotcha. Good to know. Thank you. The other thing I will mention too, you may end up getting some GUI bugs like I did. If you do, this table breakdown that's being shown here is really important because you can actually come in here and you'll see duplicates and you can remove them. So there was a bug in Orlando. They've probably fixed it right now where if you didn't specifically click the X button when you were doing a mapping and went and just selected a different field to map into it, it wouldn't actually remove the old one and you would get two of them in here. And when you would look on the GUI, it would show that it's mapping there. But then when you actually look at the results, it wouldn't pull from that attribute. And simply because in this RTE field mappings here, there were multiple entries for that specific field it was mapping into, and it would randomly pick one. So this part is actually really important to be able to see what's happening in the back end here for when those minor day one bugs end up happening. And I was able to get around most of them, but I'm sure by Paris now, they've probably fixed most of those. It's no different than when Flow Designer first came out and it had its GUI bugs. Yeah, they've released a, a number of versions since the one that we were working on. I think we were on 1.1. So they've fixed some of the issues that we certainly experienced and made it a little bit easier to work with and a bit more efficient as well. I have uh, a question back up on the GUI when you had the multiple, I, I noticed you had like two base classes and then a conditional class. So does that mean that it's going to always create two different or a total of three CIs, one for each base class and one for each conditional? Class. So it really just depends on what's in the source data. If it has nothing to map, then it'll just skip over it. Oh, okay. But if it's a base, if it's a base class, that means every single row goes to that. If it's a basic class, then would it mean every single row goes to that CI class or am I not? So, if I, so I come over and take a look at the, so it's just a basic class. So there's no conditional statement to, if I want to select it. I still have my, just everything on that row from the data source. And I just select what I want to move over that's appropriate for this class. So this one was quite straightforward. The business application name is gonna be the, the native key. And here I'm just storing some information regarding the IT owner. So just selecting what I've got available to me from the data set that's gonna be applied to this business application. But let's say, I guess I was thinking more of like if it, they were all net new CIs as opposed to updating the existing CIs. So in that case, would it insert a CI in both basic classes or just one of them? In this example, it would insert in both of them because that's where we're specifying like the business application name is going over to it. Now, so in our example right here, because I've got application service business application, sometimes customers don't know the difference and only send one you might want to build both of them out of just that one value. So I can still, I could leverage the same field like I did with the app owner and place it into multiple places of the CMDB. 
I see. Got, got it. Thank you. Now, I will say this. It'll take you a bit to get your mind wrapped around this. So when we did this for a customer, we had three layers deep that you could go. So you could have one CI relationship, another CI relationship, and another CI. But when you actually look at like the import set table, it's all a flat one row where we had like L1 app owner, L2 app owner, L3 app owner. So like they each had their own attributes. But when you insert it into the table, your L1, L2, and L3s, oh, and your layer structure is all in there on the same line. So that when you bring that back and you map it in, you end up getting that nice little structure. Now, if L3 was blank, let's, for example, we had it so that they could send a server database instance and then a database itself. Well, if they didn't have database, it would still work. You would just, uh, the way that you end up doing the mappings in here, you would end up with the server and then the database instance. So it's all based around what's actually set. And if something's not in there, it just kind of loads in whatever it possibly can for it based upon how it matches the IRE and everything. So it takes a little bit to get used to, but once you do one of them, you're like, wow, this is actually pretty easy once you figure out all those little minor things. Yeah, no, I, I could see that. It seems like it's more intuitive, more like with transform maps, you would have to create a separate map for every single table you want to go to. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. That, that was the one of the biggest issues with it, right? It made it very, very difficult to do that. Or you had to do a massive before or after script to actually insert the data on the actual loading in of the record, right? So this gives you complete visibility into what's being put in. And I didn't use the final step when you do this where you can do your test and see all that stuff. I didn't use that much. Now that I've seen it in here, I'm like, wow, I really should have used that more the first time I did it because it gives you all the information you could possibly want to see. Nice. Similar to what Chris Tessio was mentioning earlier, there is service graph connectors that you can install. And again, if these populate data that are part of a table that's part of the subscription unit, it will consume a subscription unit and you will require item visibility licensing to be able to enable them. So it's only one thing to keep in mind, but if you've done SCCM, like the connector before, or Jamf, they are quite straightforward. So you can build your own without having to to leverage ServiceNow's creation. And if you take a look at this, um, the SCCM one, it is exactly the same as the, the plugin that has been around for eight or nine years. So there's nothing new in there. You can essentially reverse engineer that JDBC query and just put it through the integration hub ETL rather than the transfer map. And the one takeaway I want to make sure everybody's aware of though, we're still, at the, we're still limited to the quality of data that's coming through from those sources. So take, for example, if you're using SCOM, Microsoft SCOM is one of those sources. It doesn't really know too much about the CI to effectively create a record. So maybe it'll get us like the main information, the name information, but we're not going to get anything regarding software, limited hardware information coming through from it. SCCM is a good deal better and we can populate OS information, some hardware information. But again, the key thing that's missing from those data sources is the relationships that exist between itself and other CIs inside the CMDB. So we can't do effective things like root cause analysis or impact analysis uh, when these are all standalone. So you always still want to advocate for using ServiceNow's discovery capabilities. Get that robust, complete CI form and also all of those relationships that exist between themselves and other items inside the CMDB. And we can also do on-demand updates to that configuration item. We can kick off a discovery job and it'll refresh all of that information inside the CMDB. And also we can pair it with Discovery's cousin of service mapping, where we can group all of those CIs together into what they deliver for the business so that we can start determining the risk and priority of certain tasks. And if anybody wants some more additional information, there is a course on now learning that goes through the, the creation of the, like an ETL and they give you all of the spreadsheet to provide and you go through some of those integration commons transformation elements. And then I included a link also to the, to the store app so you can see the release notes for the different versions that do come out. Thanks for taking time out and uh, joining us today. Yeah, we'll talk to you guys later. 